Hello. Oh, the microphone's on. That's a bit of a surprise. Um, hi, I'm Rebecca Caratti. I'm the editor of Vogue Living, and I want to thank you all for joining us here today, um, where Vogue Living gets to explore the role of art and design in the home. And I want to welcome these four fabulous women on stage with me today. Um, we'll go through one by one. We've got Natasha Allen, the creative director of Vogue Living, Emma Elizabeth, the co-founder and creative director of Local Design, Caroline Choker, co-founder of Acme & Co, and Edwina Corlett, Corlett, a gallerist showing here today at Sydney Contemporary. She's the director of Edwina Corlett Gallery. So basically today we're really going to be exploring how to buy art for the home, interior trends, kind of topics of interest in how art influences design of the home, how to buy art for the home, and a recap of emerging local and global design trends. So we're going to open up for Q&As at the end of the panel discussion. And because I've got four very different women from very different aspects of the design and art world, we're kind of going to be tackling different issues um, as we go. So we'll start with Natasha, the creative director of Vogue Living. Um, I'll give you a little bit of background of everyone as well. She's been the creative director of Vogue Living for the past three years. She has over 20 years of experience in publishing and has an impeccable eye for detail and a vast knowledge of design. She's travelled to Milan for the past two years to cover Milan Design Week for Vogue Living, and I get to work with her incredible genius every day, which is amazing. Then we've got Edwina, uh, Emma Elizabeth. She's the highly innovative designer, stylist, and creative director. Her cross-disciplinary approach to creative workings allows her to work with the realms of art, direction, design, styling, experiential, curation, events, production, buying and creati creative conceptualization. Basically, she does everything. <laughs> She's a bit of a powerhouse. Gone for hire. <laughs> with, with over a decade of experience as an Australian freelance creative, Emma created Local Design, which launched in 2015. And she really um, aims to showcase and globalise Australian design. Then we've got the amazing Caroline Choker. She's an interior designer who founded her multidisciplinary design firm, Acme, in 2013. Together, the duo is responsible for some of Sydney's most well-known hospitality venues, and they include the Grounds of Alexandria, Archie Rose Dis Distillery, and more recently, Fred's Restaurant and Bar in Paddington. Acme is a boutique practice that prides itself on a holistic approach to design with a focus on hospitality and commercial projects. And finally, we've got Edwina, and she's got almost 20 years of experience as a commercial gallery um, owner in Brisbane. And during this time, she's dealt with both blue chip works by some of Australia's most well-known contemporary artists, as well as younger artists in the earlier stages of their career. Her advice is often sought by corporate and private clients and industry professionals on matters relating to the acquisition of premium contemporary works. So we'll start with Natasha. So basically, Natasha's going to be talking about kind of redesigning luxury and what does luxury mean to her. Um, we're going to be speaking to the future of design, individuality, bespoke design, customization, and the move away from mass manufacturers. So you get to look at some of the most amazing homes, um, we both do, from around the world, and we get to highlight the latest looks in the interiors for the Vogue Living audience. What are you seeing in terms of trends and homes globally? Um, yeah, can everyone hear me? Yeah. We get asked a lot about um, trends in uh, the publishing world and um, really what I'm seeing at the moment is a huge move away from trends. Um, I guess with social media and, um, you know, mass manufacturing and um, all the genetic and engineering and all those things going on in the world at the moment, people are really trying to create an interior that is unique and special and a real kind of haven and sanctuary away from the fast pace of the everyday world. Um, I think Ben Gorham described it really well. Um, he's the founder of um, and creative director of Bayrido when he said that... Um, Luxury is really um, uniqueness and it's, it's the art of having something that someone else doesn't have and the individuality. And what we're seeing from interior designers and homeowners is a real effort to create an interior that is unique and special and 
goes against the grain of everything that's coming through on social media. Um, and how they're doing this is through the art world, using artisans, craftsmanship. Um, I guess manufacturing is changing a lot. It's um, offering up a lot of opportunities to customize furniture at the point of sale so that people really feel like they're getting something special when they're buying, making a purchase in interiors. So it's more about those bespoke pieces. Yeah, absolutely. For. Yeah, and what we're also seeing is a movement back towards antique, which is, um, you know, really beautiful as well. It's, it's that opportunity to have something special that um, isn't widely available. Uh, we've got some beautiful homes in our current issue, uh, Francesca Orsi and Tamsin Johnson's home, and really most of the interiors in those homes were created. Uh, this is Francesca Orsi's home, um, and it's about having a really modern, beautiful home that's technologically advanced, but it also includes, you know, really beautiful um, antique pieces. And collectibles. Yeah. Collectibles, and it giving the house personality and offering up something that isn't widely available and mass produced. Um, and then technology companies are really seeing the need as well to have personality. You know, I read somewhere that 50% um, of the world's jobs will be replaced by smart machines fairly quickly. Um, and one thing that those things aren't going to replace is creativity, personality, emotion. And that's where our world fits in um, to this picture and why it's such a great story for the art world is that um, they'll never be able to replace those things and they'll always want to partner with us. Um, at Rosanna Alandi's gallery in Milan this year, we saw Google um, exhibit with... Um, yeah, the Leo um, exhibition and it was really about putting their hardware in an environment that was soft and um, the, if the gallery, if you don't know it, is in a beautiful palazzo garden setting and Rosanna exhibits the most beautiful craftsmanship and artisans work from around the world. And so Google partnered with her and created this affiliation with the arts world and really um, showcased their hardware in a very soft environment that was tactile and showcased um, interiors in the home world. So the technology companies are really even seeing the need to, to create a softer side because people really do want to get, I mean, most of us spend our days in front of computers these days at work. And the home has now become a sanctuary where we really want to get away from um, technology and create, and create like create your own private side. little oasis. Create, yeah. create a sanctuary. Technology is now integrated into the furniture, into the walls. It's hidden. It's completely invisible. There's some great products coming out that you can plug your phones into as you sit and read them on your lounge. Um, you know, it used to be, technology used to be something you'd almost show off in a way, but now it's very much hidden away. Um, and yeah, and, and off the wall <laughs> and integrated. So, you know, there's a lot of micro trends around and a lot of smaller trends with color and gardens and, um, and what have you. But the real trend I think is just a desire to have something individual these days in a world that is so mass, mass produced. Mass yeah. produced. And I guess that kind of aligns with the art world as well because buying into art is buying it's into something perfect, original so. and you have yeah. to have a connection with it. There has to be like an emotional kind of meaning for it. So It's so perfect for the art world. And we're seeing a lot of those big brands really want to partner with artists and, and appreciating what they do and, and um, not interfering with what they do and understanding what the relationship has to be. But... Um, they're seeing the need for in a world of machines and gadgets to, to partner with that, um, that beautiful element. Yeah. And I guess um, a question we're always asked is, how does someone get their home or get profiled as an artist in Vogue Living? I know I get asked that constantly on I a daily basis. I get asked that constantly. <laughs> constantly. So what are we looking for, Tash? Um, 
we're definitely looking for that uniqueness that I was just talking about. So um, homes that, when you flick through, aren't running into each other and looking the same, looking like cookie cutter interiors. We're really looking for individuality and personality. Our homes really have to have personality and have a strong point of focus and point of difference. And yeah. um, and I always talk about this: ho the home has to have a soul. I'm always mm. like Natasha. It has to have a soul. I have to. Ha feel something when I like look at it on the pages because otherwise it's just this I don't know almost like an empty space so I know that's what we're always as editors looking for mm. absolutely all right um, we'll move on to Emma so how do you think the lines of art and design have been blurred because Tash was just talking about how you know the lines of kind of like luxury and technology and design and you know the boundaries of all these worlds have been blurred how we're seeing them so how do you think these I think over the past couple of um, years especially with different shows and different galleries around the world I mean you saw the start of Design Miami that connected with Art Basel mm -hmm. and I think that particular show probably had a really big push um, in regards to furniture becoming part of the art world You've got other galleries like Galleria Creo in Paris, Carpenter's Workshop, Rosanna Orlandi. So I think, as bad as it is to say, I'm sure <laughs> the art gallery world will probably disagree with me, but I think the, the boundaries have kind of gone. I don't think, I mean, I do understand the establishment, but I think design is art, but it's a functional piece of art, and it's still collectible and limited edition. There's stories, it can grow in value, so I think there needs to kind of be a kind of redefined category, whether they call it design art or art design, but it definitely is sitting in a unique niche at the moment. Yeah, because, you know, everyone cross-collaborates as well, yeah. so there doesn't really need to be very distinctive worlds or distinctive no. industries anymore. Um, and why do you think it's so important for Australian design to be seen at the shows like Milan Design Week? Because I know you're a big advocate to really take our local talent and kind yeah. of showcase them to the world. I think, um, I mean, I've always seen over the years, there's what's like the Olympics of the design world. Like there's always the Japanese doing something, there's the Swedish, there's the Londoners, <laughs> and it is really like, <laughs> it's like the Olympics in Australia, I feel in Milan especially has never really had a, like a strong voice. I think mm -hmm. this year there was like half a million visitors. Like it, it's the biggest show in the world. So yeah, like I heard it was the most Instagrammable event in the world as well, yeah. which just kind of shows the power of it. So, yeah. yeah, and I think shows like that allow people to create a dialogue to Australian design. Like when mm -hmm. someone says, what is Australian design? I even don't really know yet. So, but if we put on shows like that, it opens up a narrative and people can speak to the design and it just lifts the industry, not just for furniture design, but I think for the art world as well. Yeah, it gives us a big platform to yeah. showcase our talent, yeah. absolutely. Um, and Caroline's the only interior designer on the panel, but <laughs> so she can kind of talk to us about how we can really incorporate art into the home. So how does art influence like an interior and a mood of a space? Yeah. I guess art brings life um, to an interior and it really does create a soulful story within a space. Um, it, you can often personally um, get influenced or it can even alter your mood. Um, at its core, interior design is based on the fundamental principles of making a space beautiful and unique. But selecting the right piece of art to go within that space is almost like the performance. Like if you add uh, the dimension and the colour and the texture, it really creates its own mood and visual expression within that space. And people often like to, like whether it's a subtle piece or really bold and impact, impactful, people like to um, have a point of conversation around that piece, you know, oh, why did you buy it? Or how, wh who's the artist? Or, like, wh what's, it, what's the point of that particular artwork? And yeah, it just really does have an emotive um, presence within, within a space or a hospitality project, um, yeah. Yeah, but because art is such a, for me, it's such a personal purchase. So how does it come about when you're working with clients? Like how? How do we purchase art? Yeah, for them? how do you purchase yeah. it for them? Art is very subjective. And <laughs> I guess the most crucial thing is understanding your client's personality and their aesthetic. Um, and it is a personal journey. I think a lot of people sometimes are a bit timid, like clients to buy art because it is a different world. 
um, and then going through the galleries and so forth, if they have someone to help them through the selection, it, um, I don't know, it, it gives them a bit of confidence sometimes. Um, for us, we always just work on a, a brief and a budget <coughs> and then uh, us understanding their personalities, we start liaising with the galleries and also some art curators and we put together, I guess, a short list of works that we present back to clients and then we take them on that journey where we explain what the artwork is, you know, what the, what's the personality, you know, what's the emotion, we, we discuss what's the emotion that it gives, do they receive from that artwork. You know, it's a really important investment. They have to love it. So, you know, this clients are spending a lot on artwork, so it's going to be in their home for a long time. So it's really important that they have a connection. Yeah. And you just work through that step and, by step. And I guess it's quite different when you're working on a resident, residential project as opposed to, like, one of your kind of commercial yeah, projects. I guess residential projects are always... Um, I, because they're more personal, the client is there all the time. Um, it, it, the commercial viability of a hospitality project, just it's, it's, there's not as much of an emotive connection. Mm -hmm. It's more about, like, how does that artwork make patrons feel, but they don't have to sit with it 24-7. Yeah. Um, residential is a different story. But it's actually funny, even I was reading an article um, on Forbes, and it was saying how artworks within the workspace, the productivity that it was giving, they were doing a study, how it was um, women compared to men. And women were responding 50% uh, more to a beautiful artwork that made their productivity at work better. So it's really interesting how a beautiful piece within a room can change or create soul within that space and, yeah. And so, uh, obviously, you're working with, like, specs and colour schemes and, you know, lighting. So, can you talk us through how you kind of deal with these different situations yeah. when dealing with art? Sometimes, like, yeah, we'll work with clients who already have a particular piece. Um, and that piece needs to be the hero or have the be the performance in the room. So, you know, like, you work back with the finishers um, and... Uh, sometimes it's subtle, sometimes it's not. Um, and then other times, you know, you'll work with the interior first and then say it's a bold room with a coloured wall, then you'll pick the piece that accents against that. Um, and lighting, I mean, for us, we always work with lighting consultants because as you can buy a beautiful piece, but if you don't light it the right way, it won't sing. It won't have that, um, that kind of glow mm -hmm. for people to connect with. So, yeah. And what are some of your favourite galleries in Sydney? Um, <laughs> Sarah Quadia, Tim Olsen, um, I'm, are you going to put me on the spot here? <laughs> um, I'm, I'm gone blank. <laughs> Edwina Corlett, yeah. in, yeah. Brisbane. Yeah. 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 in Brisbane. In Brisbane, in Brisbane. Rosalind Oxley. Um, um, and obviously you did the interiors for Fred's in Paddington, which is yeah. such a beautiful space. Um, and you don't only have art, but you have objects. Can you talk sure. us through how, you know, when like almost like decorating a wall, it doesn't necessarily have to be art. You can like collect, like Natasha was talking about before, like collectible items. Can you talk us through how you kind of... Yeah, I think, I think within a space and an interior, it's always about um, having the layers. The layers create the texture and the soul and whether it be an artwork or a styling piece or um, in, in Fred's, I don't have the image here, but there's a wall and it's all beautiful old chopping boards and timber boards. And that creates the drama within a stairwell. And they're not art pieces, but it's, it's the, we've got quite a number of them and it's the, um, uh, just like using the them on mats effect, and yeah. creating, yeah. Yeah, it's like an installation, and that's the thing. Installation of objects is um, classified as art as well. Um, this particular picture, uh, this particular piece was just a simple, um, you know, paint, oil painting of a, a dog with one feature light over the top and one candle really kind of solidified the mood within that front of the bar area. Mm. So things can be really simple, um, or you can layer to create um, more texture and... And when you're working with a space, do you match colours or you don't even go into that territory? Um, it, within an interior? Yeah. Within an interior. With art. Like with, with art. art and the interior. Uh, I think you start with your canvas. Yeah. You, you, you have your canvas, you create the, 
the textures and the materials, and then you bring in the, bring in the art to see how it accents against it. You know, you want that to be. Often, art is the hero within the room. It's the performance that speaks. So, mm -hmm. um, amazing. And then we'll move on to Edwina, um, who is the amazing gallerist. Uh, can you tell us what's the most important thing to consider when choosing artwork for your space? be that a home, an office, or a workspace? I think the, the most important thing, the, 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 best, the, the best place to start is you have to really buy something you love. Um, you, you have to buy something you love because it's, it's a significant investment, you know, financially, but also emotionally, it's, it's something that you're going to have in your space, in your home or your office, hopefully for a very long time. And uh, of course, taste change, you know, things shift um, and you might, you, know, you might grow tired of something after two years, five years, 10 or 20, or you, you might not, but, and you, you might want to hand things on to your, your children. So you, you have to really love something. The, the, the first point is that you, you have to buy things that you love. Um, secondarily, I guess, uh, and I suppose I'm talking about if you're buying for your home or your office, um, I might be jumping the gun here, but you know, people also buy art for investment. Uh, and that's a kind of a, a, a different way of buying or, or buying for a different reason. But I would, you know, I'd also say to people who are buying uh, for investment, you still have to love it. Mm -hmm. And there's never any guarantee that, that something is going to increase in value anyway. Of course, any gallerist will tell you that all of their art's work <laughs> will, will increase, of course. <laughs> Uh, and uh, in my case, my, my gallery, I'm, I'm um, particularly interested in an artist in the earliest stages of their career. So uh, when you buy a work from us, uh, it's, it's a little bit of a speculative buy because the artists don't have a great long exhibiting history um, that sort of mid-career or blue chip artists might have. But that's exciting too. And if you're buying from a good gallery, you know, a gallerist isn't going to be backing a young artist unless they've really got faith in them. Um, I think we see ourselves as being on a journey with our artists and also with our clients. And, uh, you know, we're in it for the long haul. So that's... that's what are you looking time. for when you're, like, taking on these younger artists? Like... Something that's unique. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> Sa same, yeah. same, same, as, mm -hmm. same as everything. So we're always looking for, or I'm always looking for an artist very much with their own voice, something that's new, something that's fresh, something that I haven't seen before, something that I think my clients will find interesting. Uh, and then you look at things that might uh, have, a, ha have a message uh, that might sort of tell a story or s it might have some sort of historical significance. But it, overall, it, it's just, it's, it's the vibe. Yeah. It's <laughs> yeah, it's that. It's, it's that actually silly, but it's, isn't it? yeah, yeah, it's it's. Gosh, that's interesting. Well, I haven't seen anything like that before. So, yeah. something the that's yeah, yeah there's something. There's so much out there, and I think social so media has changed everything so much that you're it aware of. Mm. It is. You're aware of so many different styles and. Mm. And yeah. to have cut through in that market is the challenge. And if anyone knew the magic formula, I think mm. they'd be a millionaire. But it, it is, it's coming up with something different and unique all the time. Yeah. That's right, mm. that's right. Yeah. And you're also looking for an artist who's really committed. You know, they've, they've probably been to university or art school. They're, 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 they're really committed. It's their career. It's not sort of like a you know, painting for a hobby. or and, and there's nothing wrong with people who paint for a hobby, but it's... You know, it's a career. It's their passion. It's, it's their, their well, job. it's their career. Yeah. Yeah. You know, they've, they've got mortgages. Yeah. They've got kids. They they're, have to pay the bills. They have to pay yeah. the bills. <laughs> so, you know, it's... it's um, I think sometimes there's this idea that it's a very sort of romantic uh, occupation, being an artist. And maybe in the past, you know, you heard all sorts of stories about this wonderful life and they're an artist and they float around and then they'll, <laughs> they, you know, they always live in the most beautiful places in the world and, uh, 
that's in part is true, but, but they're committed. And when they've got uh, an exhibition, when they're preparing work for an exhibition, that's 12 months of in the studio at nine in the morning, they're often there till 10, 11 at night, really, really working for a show. So yeah, it's completely it's, it's dedicated, yeah. Absolutely, they're, they're like all of us here, clocking on, clocking off. Yeah. So it's, it's a big, yeah, it's a big deal. And how would you describe, like how important is it to consider buying artwork as an investment when considering which works to buy? Look, it's always, it's always good to know that you're buying something that, well, you, it, it's, it's, as I said, it, it, it's, it's a bit speculative, isn't it? You can never guarantee. I mean, clients say to me, well, how much will this be worth in five years? I don't really know. Yeah. But, you know, I wouldn't be backing this artist again. If you didn't believe in if them. I, if yeah. I didn't believe in them and if I wasn't in it for the long haul with them. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm on a journey and I'm yeah. helping them through their career, selling their work to institutions, the National Gallery, state museums, <coughs> corporate collections, um, private individuals, all of us here. So that's really my job as a conduit between my artists and the best collections that I can place their work in. Um, uh, and it's, it's hard, it's not easy, you know, yeah. it's, it, it doesn't just all happen. But, um, and I suppose ultimately with things like social media, which is so visual and you can just, you know, run your thumb down Instagram and say, yes, no, I like it, I don't, I do, I don't, mm -hmm. whatever. Um, you know, artists can, and art artists are taking photos of their work as they're producing it in the studio. And I have to say, well, how am I relevant? Do they need me? You know, they're mm -hmm. being bombarded by requests mm -hmm. on Instagram. Mm -hmm. I want to buy that. How mm -hmm. much is it? How can I get it? So, yeah, my job is really to, I suppose, I, to, to get their work in the best collections that I can. Is your advice to them to keep it off social media until you no. watch it? No, you can't, you can't really do that you can't. now. You can't, you can't, no. no. I, I, I think some galleries don't like it when, yeah. when, when artists do that, but you can't really stop it. That's, that's, that's life yeah. in 2018. It's their platform we find and their voices. Yeah. Challenge, I guess, with keeping things exclusive. publishing is keeping things exclusive, yeah. getting our our homeowners to keep it offline until we've had a chance to present it in yes. in the best light with the top photography to not kill the the excitement of yes. of the release. So, yeah, yeah, I, I I hear that and I get it, mm. but I, you, it's but there's still such a different experience mm. entering a gallery and yes. seeing it hung and seeing art in you know in its entirety. So mm. I don't think Instagram could ever replace galleries. Yeah. Mm. No, no, it's a hot debate though, it's a hot debate. I was talking to Michael Reed, um, terrific gallerist in Sydney yesterday, and he was saying that, you know, maybe in sort of five years' time, uh, there may not be a need for, you know, four white walls. Maybe you can do everything online. Mm -hmm. And I can certainly say that, you know, 90% of sales from our gallery are initiated online, and that might be Instagram, mm -hmm. it might be, uh, Inst Instagram is really big in our industry, but also uh, our, you know, email e-shots that we send out to people. I mean, that we, we don't even know where that's going. It's yeah. impossible to quantify the the um, how wide that's going. Spread. Same with yeah. Instagram. So yeah, it finally only leaves the big institutions to collect the pieces, and then all of the little guys. Where do they like? Do you mean? people buying art. Yeah, well, no, collecting the art. So it would just leave, if all of the galleries kind of went away just to digital online. Yes. And it would be like these big powerhouse galleries that would have to. Yeah, I mean, look, that, that was just one, one, that's one idea. I think it's really important yeah. to have a space and I hope I've always oh, got I a think space. Because well. it brings a community together as well yeah. and it opens up a discussion yeah. and yeah. yeah. I, I truly believe that yeah. Instagram won't kill the world. No. <laughs> I often no. talk to interior designers about this, is how you can possibly buy art for someone else and your clients. And I know they work really hard to get into their headspace, but I think it's in the same light as, I think you actually probably need to see an artwork yeah. in, think, uh, in uh, its absolutely. flesh to it truly commit. <laughs> online is great to, as you're saying, like get a short list together, yes. but you don't get a, 
an emotive response unless you're in front of that piece, yeah. you know. And also scale, like mm. when you look at something online or on screen, you know, you don't necessarily understand the scale um, until you're in front of it. And, you know, what's that texture of that yeah. piece, you know? And how is that really going to fit on that wall? I think, yeah, it, I think it's a tool, but I don't think it will help. It's an interesting yeah. conversation. It is. Sorry, because people said that about fashion, that you needed to try things on, but look at where the fashion world's gone. They're all shopping online. And people say that about furniture to us constantly. And mm. we hear the retailers saying, no, but you need to sit on a couch and touch it. Mm. But the thing with shopping but online, it's moving. which is big, <laughs> yeah. you still can buy it, try it on and send it back. Send it back, yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. <laughs> can you hang it on your wall and send it back very easily? You probably yeah. can well, try. Yeah. Try. Well, it, it, is, it is a tricky topic. We're going yeah. a little bit off topic. We're not <laughs> talking about social media when we should be talking about buying art for the home. So we'll wrap it up there and we'll leave it open for you guys to ask some questions because we've, we've got these four amazing women, um, experts in their fields. So does anyone have a question for them? Yes. Is there a microphone? of artists textiles and in a way that was democratizing the art world you know I mean one can't possibly I love some work here you know and it's 400,000 or something um, uh, and people like um, uh, Ben Nicholson and John Piper and quite famous Patrick Heron quite famous British artists actually made artists textiles which then you could you know buy a limited number of them I mean they weren't obviously um, sold by IKEA, but um, uh, I, I'd like to know what your views are on things like that, because really, in a way, the, the art world has become very commercialized, and um, it's difficult for people to, um, ordinary people, they just don't buy art, because they'd they go out and buy a car. They, um, you know, so that's yeah, what Yeah, I we guess because they don't understand it, do they? They don't have that education. So, Edwina, well, what, do you, what do you think? Uh, uh, is your point, uh, is your question relating to uh, that, that art isn't affordable uh, it, uh, for everybody? Well, it's partially that, but partially. I mean, artist textiles are a way to, um, you know, to do interior design. I mean, you bring the, yeah. the art into your room in a different way, in, in, you know, for a, a fraction of the price. And if you don't like it, you can change it. You know, you're not making a £100,000 investment or a $10,000 investment or whatever it is. And, and um, so I, I just wondered what your views were on that. Um, I mean, now Pollock's made into scarves and whatever, yeah. so I was interested yeah. in the panel's view on artist textiles, basically. Well, what, one of my artists, Miranda Skocic, who, who many of you may have heard of, uh, recently collaborated with Gorman, so she did a range of clothing. I think Reese Lee did that. Um, artists collaborate uh, in fashion, Joseph McLennan did some beautiful silk scarves. Fine, fine, you know, but fine. You, you, you can't if you, you can't stop people. You, you, you know, that's the way of the world. That's how I feel about it. If that's what they want to do, uh, you know, and they, if, fine. And I think that's what Emma Elizabeth was talking about, is this cross-collaboration and these blurred mm. boundaries yeah. between these industries. Mm. I mean, it's all design. Rules like for rules to be broken. Yeah, <laughs> rules to be yeah. broken. A, so. yeah, a beautiful textile hanging on a wall is an installation piece Absolutely. within a space. So it yeah, definitely works hand in hand as mm. you know, an artwork. Mm. One, of my, one of my artists recently had a, a work of his uh, not sprayed on, but um, I don't know even what the due code or something onto a BMW is some sort of BMW promotion. So if you see a BMWs driving around with fantastic uh, John Asselinidis work on it, it you know that's that's what that was, and it was some kind of promotion. You know, it's it's getting the artists, it's it's making art slightly it more visible. Um, you know, it's a more accessible piece. as yeah. well. Yeah, so I think we went to a stage too where the big businesses were being heavy handed with artists and now I'm seeing a lot more of them have a real appreciation and seeing their role in supporting the arts rather than 
trying to manipulate what the artists are doing and control it. Um, you know, they're seeing that the alignment has to be mutually beneficial um, and not trying to, to control the artist as much. Mm. Yeah. You mentioned that uh, one, one, one of the important characteristics of a space is that it's in fact indi individualistic, which I presume means it's a reflection of the individual who lives or works in that space. Mm -hmm. Um, so, do you think there's a certain contradiction if that person hires a team of interior designers and art <laughs> consultants to choose what that interior is, that perhaps it's not a reflection of the individual and maybe it's a reflection of what that individual wants to be perceived as in the world rather than as to who they are themselves? Uh, yes. <laughs> a, sim a simple answer is yes. I totally agree with you. I wish I could have a different response, but no, I, I do agree. And sometimes I do struggle with that notion that someone would hire an interior designer to just be like, go for gold, create my space without having any kind of input. But I think Caroline can talk to this more because she deals with those clients. Like what is that working relationship like? Like how much input does that, yeah, I, I does guess, the owner have? As I was saying, I guess for us, it is really about understanding the person personality and the aesthetic of the client. I mean, I, we don't want to project our likes onto them. So we spend the time to uh, create that short list of artworks, but then walk them through each piece. They have to resonate and connect with that work that goes in their place. It, 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 mind you, you will get people that just say, just do it, put whatever you want there, make it look beautiful, and there isn't that connection. <laughs> well, but we, we are constantly trying to educate you know, this is an investment. You're spending, um, you know, beautiful artworks do cost a lot. So you, you are spending a, a, an amount on the artwork. You need to sit with it. So you need to be comfortable with it as well. So, you know, we walk through it and take our clients on a journey. Um, I, but, I, you know, it does differ out there. Yeah, and obviously the homes that we feature in Vogue Living are generally the homes of creatives and designers and artists. So that doesn't really affect our spaces, they are individual spaces, they do have a soul, they do have like a creative kind of buzz yeah, around they them. Really need to tell the difference from yeah. the space where the interior design and the architectural team has just walked out compared to what we're actually looking for in a house. Um, you know, if you see empty bookshelves, for example, it's a pl pretty glaring statement that um, this house is just been finished by an interior designer and, and they're photographing it compared to a home that has real possessions of real people. And what we're really trying to tell is the story of, of real people and not just an interior design poem. Um, yeah. So there are some key things that we look out for in the homes that come to us. We do get a lot of photography and a lot of interior designers who are keen to promote their work. but. Um, We've kind of become good at seeing through, mm. um, seeing through the layers, some of the yeah. layers, and and seeing a house with real personality, um, which I guess were evident in some of the slides that came up earlier, um, with real people in them and real possessions compared to um, a home that's been fitted out from a shop. Yeah. Um, Does that answer your question? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone There's else? Another question over here. You might not be able to see. My question is: How do we go about educating people about the importance of buying original art versus the art print, which shouldn't have the word art <coughs> in front of it, as far exactly. as I'm concerned? Um, and about just decorating a room with a xeroxed framed print rather than supporting artists who are creating original works, or are artists, is that still art, or not? Xerox work. Well, like photographs. Bad idea. You know, like <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But how do we educate, you know, buyers and decorators of homes and architects and interior designers or whatever, that original art is how we support artists, not by buying a print of their work? In the design world, we call <laughs> the fake design replica design, and it's <laughs> even more of a kind of work. It is. 
Look, I think not, not everybody can afford original art. Um, on that, there are, there are ways now, things like art money, that make buying artwork much more accessible for people. So art money is um, an organisation that offers interest-free loans to buy contemporary Australian works under $20,000. So Amazing. it's opened up a whole new world of opportunities for people uh, who don't suddenly have $5,000 in their back pocket or even two or even one to buy an artwork. So, so there are things like that. That's uh, the first thing. Second thing, um, I, think, I think prints can be great. Limited edition prints signed and numbered by the artist um, that you could buy for, you know, five, between five and fifteen hundred dollars. I think that's great. I think it's a, a good sort of entry point for perhaps younger people or, you know, people again who, who can't afford, you know, some thousand dollars to buy uh, something, you know, really beautiful by an artist whose work they love. Lots of galleries now, my, mine included, are uh, offering um, limited edition prints signed and numbered by our artists, so they're authenticated. Uh, you know, eleven hundred dollars compared with you know seven or eight thousand. So I think that's fine. I, I, I think it's great, and I encourage it because it's a it's an entry point. It's a good entree into buying and collecting art and appreciating art. Uh, Xeroxing, really bad idea. Um, <laughs> what is Xeroxing? I know what. You, uh, okay, it's the IKEA. <laughs> yeah. Look, I mean. It, yeah. Well, you know what? It, it, it's something, isn't yeah. it? It, it, it? It mightn't be what we like or we find interesting, but it's something. It's, it, it's something. It's, it's a thought about putting something on the wall to, to make a space more comfortable, more attractive, more beautiful, more homely. So I, I'm not knocking it. I, I don't like it, but I, I'm not knocking it because, it, you know, it's, it's... Each to their own. Each yeah. to their own. Thank you. Yeah. thing. <laughs> yeah. don't necessarily have really high-end art, but yeah. there's lots of examples of how to be creative in there. You know, there was a home recently where someone had framed part of an old wedding dress and, um, you know, we definitely encourage people to have special objects around the home as art if you can't afford the high-end art. And I'm telling you, some of those homes are the most beautiful that we've yeah, featured. I'm sure. It's just about thinking outside the square, I guess, with art and not necessarily thinking that you have to buy the most expensive pieces and the most celebrated pieces and, and just having something in your house that has meaning to you and has personality and telling your story that way rather than having spent a fortune on the and, phone. And, you know, comp augments the space, complements the space, whatever it might mm. be. So. That's a great idea for all your wedding dresses yeah, exactly. that might just be sitting, sitting in, in your closet. wardrobe. <laughs> Chop a bit off and frame it. Um, does anyone else have a question? Yes. I was just thinking, you know, when I think back to when I was a teenager, back in the 70s, but, you know, there were posters and you'd put a poster up on your wall and you felt so great about having that poster. So I think that there's something about whatever you've, when you've put something up on the wall and you've chosen it, and it may have been very accessible, but it's still, it's something you love. And when it's something you love, then it, it is putting your personality and your soul into that space. Yeah, yeah. I, I totally agree with that. Yeah, you just have to love it. No one else has to love it, yeah. It has to bring an emotion and a connection to you. I think art is a self-expression. It's a form of self-expression for um, people within the home. Yeah. yeah. Well, we might wrap it there if no one's got any more questions. No? Well, thank you all for coming. Um, I hope you enjoyed our talk, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the fair. Thank you. Thank you.